Hey guys, this is Mark Owings, and I'm your host for the Unbridled Life Podcast, where we have real, raw, and unreligious conversation to encourage and challenge men and women in their daily lives. Well, welcome to the Unbridled Life Podcast. Man, I know I say it every week that I'm pumped. I have a special guest, but man, today, my hero's on, but my cousin, Jeff Owings, is on with me. And I couldn't be more thrilled. I've had a lot of spiritual fathers impact people, James Robinson, John Wilkerson, Bob Massey. I I could just sit here and list the people. But the beginning of this, the middle of this, and he's still walking with me today, is my cousin, my older cousin, much older cousin, (laughs) Jeff Owings, is with us. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mark. Great to be here. Well, it's good to have you. I've been wanting to do this for so long because I want to record it not only for today, but as a journal to our kids. When we're long gone, (laughs) they're going to watch this. And Jesus showed up in our family, and it started with this guy. So, Jeff, tell us a little bit about your family, and we'll take off on this. Well, Mark, you know, the first time I saw you, I remember it. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I don't know how much older I am than you, but I'm I'm guessing I was like six or seven or something like that. When I was a baby. And you were a baby and y'all lived in Louisville, Kentucky, and your 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 mom and dad brought y'all down, you and Eric down to uh it was before Andrea to to see us and visit. So in my sister's room they put a little baby crib <laughs> and I hadn't been around babies before and I went in there. I just remember I'd go in there and I'd look at you and you'd you'd play with me and just do whatever you were going to do. I don't remember the details too much, but I know that was the first time I'd ever been around a baby, and it was you. It's the first time I seen you. Well, I always say this about my cousin. He knows me better than myself because he was there before I even was conscious that he was there. And so I, I, I'm just so grateful for you. And just the beginning, the genesis of Jesus in our family started with you. And so you've got six kids. Tell us about your family. Well, I have uh, six kids. Uh, two, uh, the, the the first one is Bethany, and uh, it's pretty pretty Ooh, interesting. <laughs> that gets you in trouble. You know? Every single time. <laughs> you know the uh, when my my wife and I at the time we uh, we had lost two babies right in a row, and uh, we were just going to give her body time to recoup. We'd always knew we wanted to adopt. So uh, three months after. After uh, Caleb died at uh, six months term, uh, she was born, and um, we flew to Erie, Pennsylvania, and got her. And it was a three month process from the day we said, you know, let's adopt. Most so. beautiful <laughs> little girl you've ever seen. I love that little girl, mm-hmm. Bethany. <laughs> uh, Me too. Yep. Yeah. And so your next is Jonathan. Johnny. Then so then then we had Jonathan, and he, then he's my favorite. Yep. You've always said that. <laughs> and then we got Thomas. My next favorite. And then uh, Jeffrey. Favorite. And then we've uh, uh, we adopted a Tiger. Favorite. He, he was two when we got him, two years on the dot. And then uh, and then later, uh, we had Hogan. Come on. My next favorite. They're all favorites, <laughs> so y'all can't hold me to any of that. So you got six kids, uh, blended family now. Um, just crazy story, but Jeff, I, I want to go back if we can, just your childhood when this started, you grew up in a God fearing Bible thumping family, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not exactly. No. So, um, Mark, your family and, and mine and also Aunt Mildred's, we all lived in Fort Worth eventually mm-hmm. and pretty much just all around our grandma and grandpa that we share. I don't. I know they were a member of a church somewhere, but I don't know much about it. And um, love my grandma and grandpa, but I don't ever remember them talking about God. Never. <laughs> I would have friends that I would ask to, uh, you know, hey, you want to come to my house or something? And they would say in, in middle school, they would say, no, nah, you, we can't come to your house. Y'all aren't Christians. <laughs> I, I would I did, I'd say, what does that mean? I don't even know what that means. And I'd go home and I would ask, and I couldn't get an answer I would get some things like the church is the mafia, they're bad, they're evil, stay away from them. So uh, I finished, I guess, growing up, if you call that, to 18 years old, 
or in my case, 21, never been inside of a church, not for a wedding, a funeral, <laughs> never been in one, had no idea what the inside of a church was like. You stayed out of that va vampire covenant? <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Until you didn't. Right. That's right. So you, you go through all that. Jeff, you were talking before we went through this, just talking about your parents, just like many of the listeners, went through divorce. There was an impact story you were sharing when this thing shifted gears for you, uh, when your parents got divorced. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, through high school, I don't know, I, somehow I wanted to identify or I identified or something as uh, the biggest drinker, the biggest willing to try this Check. drug, <laughs> you know, the most, the last guy standing of any kind of, any kind of thing that was probably bad. You know, it's called partying, but I hate that because it's not partying. It's, it's just destruction mm. and hatred and hurt, but it's called partying. But I wanted to be the last guy standing. And, um, you know, when, I, when I, everyone went to college, I met another guy that we, we knew each other, but we hadn't been real close before Steve, and we got super close. He was my equal in last man standing mentality. So we we started, uh, you know, just just putting life through the ringer there. But my parents had divorced. They got me out of high school, and I, I was the youngest. And I think they they thought, well, this we're done. You know, we can do our divorce. We've been wanting to do now. Uh, we finished, but. Man, when I look back, I needed them more. I needed them more then than I ever did before. 100%. I didn't know the word like covenant. But looking back with what I know now, I totally felt like a covenant was broke. Mm. We were kind of what I don't know what anyone would call us. We thought we was rich or I did. Definitely middle class and felt like maybe, you know, felt like we were doing better than most so, you know, life was kind of nice, country clubs, nice neighborhoods, um, you know, a bunch of motorcycles and new trucks and stuff like that. When um, when they divorced, I, as I started getting tempted and, and learning new things that were bad to do, I know that there's a point where I just said, man, I can't shame my family like this. But once they were divorced... I was like, all bets are off. I don't even have to, I don't even have to consider that. If this is something I want to try or do, I don't have, I don't have any, mm -hmm. I don't have a contract anymore. So you're, you're free to do whatever you want to do. And yeah. Yeah. Throw it into the next gear. That's what I did. Yeah. Put the pedal down. And when he's talking about last man standing, just so you don't know, I know I've got a lot of Christian friends out there. My two cousins were like gods on the east side of Fort Worth. Uh, literally remember uh my mom tells a story we went to a dentist and she went up to the counter and there was two twins in there with their teeth knocked out and we didn't know how you know i thought it was baseball or something and when my mom introduced herself she said your last name is owings are you kin to tommy owings as she was shaking and just so pissed about it and that's the one who did that to my kids <laughs> And I just remember being ushered out really quickly. And if I said Jeff and Tommy, people split. And Eric and I, flat, they were kind of our picture to live up to. And because we grew up in similar families, other than I, Jeff's family had more of, a lot more of the wealth and success than I think our family did. I never felt rich. I never, motorcycles, the boats, the cars, trucks, none of that. But equally, you know, just without God, but when he talks about that, you're going to see a change in someone's life that went from fist to cuff, and I've never met someone tough in Jesus as this guy standing here. He Life will throw all kinds of things at him, but he always comes back. And as you hear the story, you'll see why God did such a really great weld in this guy's life. So, Jeff, you're, you're, you're doing speed. You're doing heroin. You're doing drugs. Nothing's off limits. You're partying it up, right? Yeah, so, you know, it didn't just happen. So me and Steve, we would, uh, we would, you know, we both work at this point, Monday through Friday, Saturday, you know, Friday night, we would start the partying through the night. Saturday, we would ride around and we'd, you know, hang out with people at certain spots, you know, on east side Fort Worth. We would just outlast them. 
And then we would uh, go shower up, and then we'd head to Baby Dolls, mm. something like that, and we would shut that place down. Well, what we would do is we would go buy like 10 bucks each worth of speed, and we would just snort it. And uh, this one night, we had had a really, really full, you know, 36 hours. And we show up there, and this guy, just Satan, man, just Satan working right through someone he had control of. He's He's got this apartment filled up with these weirdos at 3 in the morning. And uh, he's he's like, hey, I'm not selling y'all any. We're like, what's going on, man? You know, we're... We are wasted. You know, we've been going at it a while. We're not going to make it through the night with that little boost. Pick me up, yeah. He says, well, I'm not going to sell it to you because you don't do it the right way. So, you know, what is the right way? We don't. He said, it's shooting it up. Here it comes. We're like, I don't even, I've never even seen that. Gear number three coming right now. I don't even know a person that's done that. Mm. He goes, well, I'll do it for you. So he, he takes me first. And about four or five people standing around watching and at the bathroom door entrance, and Steve's in the bathroom with me and this guy. And he takes my arm and and he and he does it. And uh man, when he did when he was finished, I could just took my breath away. It would be like, you know, your very first experience with a female. Mm. It'd be like that, times. except times infinity. It's just not even, there's no, there's no comparison. And then you're just, you know, you're like, okay, well, how do you quit that? (laughs) (laughs) So, man, I jumped down, I threw some push-ups, you know, and just, then I jumped up and I've got my arms while Steve's in there doing his and running around my arms up. So the next afternoon after, you know, later on, we end up crashing and that afternoon Steve wakes up, you know, and I were at my house and. We said, man, we're not like that. We weren't raised that way. Let's never, ever do that again, man. Let's make a pack. So we did. How long did the pack last? Well, next weekend we said, hey, man, <laughs> what do you say one more time? We go be Superman. <laughs> yeah. And then the next week is like Wednesday. Hey, man, let's go do this one more time. And, you know, pretty soon it was just it was just full blown. And I always, I you know, when I grew up, I just always was, kind of buying, selling, and trading. You've always been an entrepreneur. So, man, it was an easy step for me because it was expensive just to start selling it. So buying larger quantities, splitting it up, and selling small quantities. So that's what I started doing that um, Mm. led down another road. But that, that gave me the ability to have no limits on how much I could do. So you've gone from... A family, no God, parents get divorced, covenant's broken. You don't even know that word. You just know something's been broken in the atmosphere. You hit gear two. You wind that all the way out through fighting and drinking, just doing the stuff that we did growing up. Then you hit gear number three in baby dolls, which is a strip joint if you don't know what that is. And my dad designed and built it. So Jeff's in there. And a guy comes out and introduces my cousin to the death squad. This is the enemy's ploy to kill him. 100%. That guy doesn't know it. We bless that guy. Hope he's saved, but he's probably dead. Truth be known. But you get this gear and now you start selling dope. I don't know how old I was at the time, but I remember my cousin, my mom and dad, Uncle Tom and Aunt Rennie, and I called her Aunt Rennie my whole life. Loved my aunt. We're over at the house and I hear him talking and Jeff's going to come over and when I see him, he's got a bandana and all the whites of his eyes have blood in them because he got in a fight and it was a really bad fight. And you, I could even tell as a kid, like, man, that's not good. My cousin who's Superman, there must be a bigger Superman out there because this, I don't know how big this guy was, but things are increasing in your life in a bad way. And so you start telling, selling dope which ends up leading you into another part of your story where someone comes and buys dope that's not. Yeah. Yeah, this this one girl, she was a stripper. She would come by, and I was already selling, and she she liked heroin, but she would come by some speed if, if for whatever reason. I, I can't remember the exact reason why she would switch gears. 
Anyway, along the way, she got caught down at the projects uh, buying heroin and coke by narc. And he he just made a deal with her that, hey, if you'll help us get someone, get a dealer. So she introduces him to me as a friend of her uh, of her husband's, her boyfriend's or her husband or some, some guy in her life. <clears throat> So he came by three different times, and uh, wow. he bought he bought drugs from me. I never paid attention that he wasn't doing them. Uh, That's a federal offense, just for y'all. <laughs> He's selling to an arc. Yeah, yeah. It was a it was one of them was a first degree, and there were two third degree felonies based on the different substances. Mm. So anyway, uh, he he um, he disappears. I go down sick, so I'm down sick for six or so weeks with hepatitis. Couldn't get up out of bed. It was a really bad six weeks. Is hepatitis from sharing needles? Yeah. 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 So what happened was, the way I got that, <laughs> uh, this girl I was telling you about, she came by and asked me if I'd run her down to the projects to get some heroin and Coke. And I said, yeah, I'll do that, but I'm not doing any. I've got some meth going to be here in a little while, and I'm I'm just, that's my night. This is the way this afternoon is going mm -hmm. for me. So, so I said, I'm not even going to bring my own syringe with me. I don't want to get tempted. So I get down there, and I watch her do it, and I'm just like, okay, I'll take a boy and a girl, so, you know, two capsules. So I take it, and um, I said, does anyone around here have a syringe? And uh, like you know, nah, there's some in the fridge, mm. and um, in a in a bucket, a clear bucket. But they don't have running water, so it's just a bucket of old water with syringes in there. And I just looked for one that still had the most writing on it. Like this has to be the least used. Wow. And anyway, I was pretty sick right after that. <laughs> I don't remember how many days or weeks. So you get hepatitis, you go down. And when when does this all fold down on you where you realize this isn't a guy buying, this is an undercover agent? Well, so finally, you know, I'm up out of bed again. I had to go stay at my mom's house, and um, I was just out. You know, just don't really remember much of that other than it was awful. And it was, I guess, the first or second day that I got out again and started driving. How old are you at this time, Jeff? I'm 20. I'm 20. All right. 20, uh, I'd say right around 20, maybe early 21. Okay. And um, so I'm driving. Everyone who would see me would tell me that people are asked, cops are asking about me. So they were trying to find me. I guess they had everything they needed to make the arrest. But you don't know they got anything on you. I don't. Right. So I'm driving and I get pulled over and, uh, and arrested and I find out what it's for. <clears throat> and... Um, I stayed kind of straight for a few days because I had been straight for six weeks, but it just starts because you're so sick. Yeah, so it starts cycling back into the same, you know, pattern. So I, I'm heading, I'm heading that way, and then I, you know, go to court, and then get an attorney, and then turn, you know, time goes by, and I'm back fully on everything again, and he's saying I'm the best deal is two years. Uh, serving two years in prison. Yeah, yeah, and I me, mean, I can't believe that this is me, but this is what I ask. I ask everyone that I was dealing with, "Are you absolutely positive I can get drugs in prison? Because if I can, I don't care." So, time out. Your biggest concern at that point is not going to jail for two years. Your biggest concern is, can I get dope in there? Right. That's right. So, and everyone's like, "Yeah, yeah, you can." That's no. That's no, no issue. problem. So uh, I really didn't have a huge issue with going. Mm. Mm. Man, I'm starting to smile because all, all I'm going to say is, here comes God. Here comes <laughs> God. And so you're messed up. You've got the book thrown at you. So just to back up, one thing I, I wanted to mention was before I was just completely, you know, going all out on just to f destroy myself with drugs as fast as I can because of 
a decent upbringing, not spiritual, but a good family unit being yep. being raised in. Uh, I, I had a conscience that knew, you know, I really got to fight this addiction. I really don't need to be this this guy. I need to get my life normal, back to normal of some sort. <clears throat> And it was a constant fight. I would I would quit, and I would quit for like a mm-hmm. few hours, and I'd be like, "All right, that's enough for this, you know, this time." Reward yourself. Yeah. So so I this I had this vision or dream or spell. I don't know what it was, but it was very real to me, and it was in this completely black room, like a well space, completely black. And there was this big green thing like a Shrek before there was such thing as Shrek. This Shrek isn't friendly, though. Right. No, and it's, it's way bigger. And it's in this pitch black, it's all I could see kind of glowing, you know, and it was running after me. And I was running and looking back over my shoulder, and I'd fall. And I'd get back up out of breath, and I'd run, and I'd fall. And at one point, I fell, and it was closer and closer, and I just said, you know what? Screw it. Take me and do what you want. Do what, have your way with me. I can't get away from you. Yeah. And I'm tired of this fight. And when I was back to myself from that vision or dream or whatever that was, I knew what that meant. And that meant quit fighting this addiction. Just let it take you over. Just let it have you. Just give it. And you gave yourself yourself to to it. it. And I was, I was in a mindset of hoping that this would just kill me within a couple of years. You know, mm-hmm. just do drugs and just let this end. Hopefully it doesn't take forever. Mm-hmm. So that was that was the mindset as I was, you know, pretty much going into prison. I had already wrote off my life as a as a failed attempt. Mm-hmm. Wasted space. But God didn't. And and God's working a plan. And I love talking about all this so you can see it in color. It so that you can really see honestly, that's black and white. Color's coming. Jesus is coming. For whatever reason, there's no reason why anyone in the Owings family would be picked. Certainly not him. Certainly not me. We, we've always kidded around. He took the worst one, and when he was done getting him right, he went to the next worst one in our family, and then God does this amazing story. But God starts showing up. How do you, how do you even end up in a freaking church that you've never been to? <laughs> so tell what what shifts man it's it's awesome i love i love this part of the story More. you know i dread all the part me too we just talked about i hate it i only am willing to talk about it if there's anyone out there at all anywhere that anyone hearing this could could have some hope but i can't stand I, and i don't even mm. identify with that person you know it's not only was it so long ago but it was such a different person but my mom was not okay with me going to prison. Like that was a big deal to her. <laughs> and she seemed to have a problem with you going to jail for <laughs> she did. <laughs> and uh Thank God for Aunt Rainey. So she's working with a guy at a at a Buick dealership in Fort Worth who who has a close friend that is getting counseled at Bethel Temple, which is church. Yeah the church that I ended up going to at that season. <clears throat> so my mom calls and she's like, uh, hey, uh, there's a guy there that goes to this church. She told me the church, and I mean, I rode bicycles through the parking lot. Me too. My whole life, you know, yep. growing up. So anyway, I knew the church, so I said, okay, what what good's that going to do? And she's like, well, he's the Fort Worth police chaplain. He's He's retired New York captain police captain and uh he 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 says he can keep you from going to prison so i didn't really want to so she nags at me at that a little while so anyway i finally agree so i take this girl that's living with me and uh we we go there and meet him so we go into his office and this is captain paul delina <laughs> Man, what a great man. I I had no idea who I was meeting at the time. He's a retired captain of the New York Police Department who is now a chaplain who is going to Bethel Temple, who God is divinely arranging for you. 
He's part of the cross in the switchblade, the <laughs> team challenge starting with the David Wilkerson and in New York. Oh my gosh. And all those I forget about all that. <clears throat> so he's a this guy's been around. He was in the they they were getting gangs converted up there in New York. And here I am, you know, sitting there with this little girlfriend, and he's asking a few questions. I'm hundred percent honest. I wasn't trying to hide anything. And uh he says, Well, I tell you what, I think I can help you. If you will uh if you will, between now and your court date, if you'll come to this church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, you will. Uh, I'll make sure you don't do any time in prison. Mm. So I said, "Well, how are you gonna how are you gonna do that?" <laughs> he said, "Don't worry about it. I'm Fort Worth Police Chaplain. I know everybody. Don't don't you even worry about that." This is the great part. So now I kind of got what I want. So now I, I say, "Well." Yeah, I can do that. But you guys aren't going to be coming by my house, knocking on the door, wanting to visit stuff for you. <laughs> and, man, he slams his hands down on his desk and leans up in his chair, and he says, there's nobody in this church wants to talk to you. What have you done in life besides be a disaster? There are very successful, influential people in this church that I enjoy talking to. There's... It's pain talking to you. You don't want to talk to you. <laughs> so he, he says, as a matter of fact, he says, I don't have time for you. When you come in Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, all I want you to do is get my attention back in the background somewhere and just wave. I don't want to talk to you. So he reframes all of this really quick for you, doesn't he? He flips it all around. <laughs> He's been here before. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't new to him. So, uh, so my girlfriend and I talk about it, and we're like, oh, "Yeah, we can do this." So we go to a Sunday morning, and you know, it was pretty weird, but we endure it. <clears throat> we go to a Sunday night; it was really weird, <laughs> but we endure it. So, oh, gosh. so we go Wednesday, and uh, I walk in there to the people my age, and just like, "There's no way, no way." I'm sitting in here. So I went and found a classroom. Everybody was, you know, ancient to me at that time. Which but, could have been 50 years old. Yeah, right? that's what they probably were, 40s and 50s. But anyway, I was like, this this is where I want to sit. So I sit in there Wednesday night. Next Sunday rolls around, and my girl, the girl living with me, she yeah. says, I'm, I'm not doing it, man. It's, it's too it's weird. It's too weird. <laughs> so I said, I don't blame you. It's not your deal. It's mine. So I go Sunday night again. I go the next Wednesday night, which, Mark, little trivia for you. That was March 16th, 1983, which was anniversary of that would have been yesterday. Mm. Um, so 41 years ago yesterday, I'm at that church on a Wednesday night. And in the parking lot, I shot up dope. Try to make that hour, hour and a half go by quicker, or whatever. <laughs> and when I leave, this lady, I'm getting in my car, and this lady, she pulls up, and she, she her back seat's loaded down with girls for Teen Challenge, and her husband's driving, and it's a cold March night. And she gets out, and she stops me, and she just starts asking me questions, like, what am I doing here? And, you know, I... I didn't have any business line, didn't care to lie. Right. You know, so I'm here to keep from going to prison. How's that? Well, Paul Delina. Okay. Well, if he said it, he can do it. So, okay. And then she talks a minute and then she just says, well, let me ask you this. Why don't you, why don't you serve God? Now I'm telling you, Mark, I felt something which was weird to me then. It wouldn't be weird to you, but I felt a presence. It was awesome. I, Loved my time talking to this old woman who was about 45 at the time. And what's her name? <laughs> Uenta. Uenta Brown. One of my all-time heroes, oh, Uenta my. Brown. So w when he's talking about that, you know, he had never encountered, you know, it's not the church or outside of the church, right? But yeah. you're in a parking lot and this woman's talking to you. There's a third person there. He can't describe it yet, but he's like, I, I can feel something. The, the longer this old lady talks to me, the more I can feel this presence that is probably peaceful, 
but you don't even know what that is. But I liked it. But <laughs> I liked it a lot. You're about to switch dope. Yeah. yeah. So she goes in. So she so she says, uh, "Hey, uh, why don't you why don't you give your life to Jesus?" And I said, "You know that doesn't sound like a bad idea. I've kind of liked what I've heard up here this last." Right now, I got a lot going on, and I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm just about to do a shot. I mean, I'm just about to do that as soon as I get home, which is not even a mile from here. So? <laughs> I love her. She, she says, uh, I'll tell you a story. I'll make it short, but the, the version of it is it's a parable, and it, there's this. they're making a commercial, somebody, and they need like a big old brawly guy. So they go out in the streets and they find this big old bearded, long haired guy. And, you know, just looks like he's ready to go be a lumberjack. So they hire him. They say, tomorrow, come to this studio. We're going to pay, you you know, 500 bucks. Well, he gets pretty excited. So he goes and gets a haircut and shaves. She tells the story. Great. She takes her time with it and he comes in and then they, they don't need him. They're like, we wanted you how you were. And, you know, I followed her along. I knew what she, you know, I mean, she made it clear. She was saying, that's how Jesus wants you. Just come as you are. You don't have to clean yourself up. And ma- yeah, and a matter of fact, she even went on to say that, do you know anything about Jesus, you know, in the Bible? Like what it, the Bi- our Bible talks us about what he did when he was here? And I said, not really. And she was like, well, you know, he hung out with you. If Like if he was walking here today... I don't think it's the people in that building that he would have been hanging out with. He would have been hanging out with you. Fact. She said, if if you uh if if you want Jesus to uh if you want him to, if you want to ask him into your life, it's his responsibility. I said, Well, I, I can't quit drugs. And she said, He may never want you to, <laughs> but it's on him. So so I asked, so you're saying I could be a Christian and be on drugs? Sure. Yeah, that's on Jesus. This woman of faith knows something we don't know yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to figure it all out. But here's how I know, Mark, that, man, this is this is my favorite part of any story I ever tell, and it's a small part in this story. I tell her I'm going to think about that. So I drive home, and it's, it's literally not a mile. So, I mean, I'm home in 30 seconds. <clears throat> I walk into my little bitty house, and my girlfriend that lived there with me, she has my tray, and it has on it syringes, razor blades, cotton, a little cup of water, mirror. You know, it has everything. So instead of a drink being served, your poison's being served. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's everything I need to load up a syringe and, and to hit myself. So... I walk in the house and she's and I, I I was gone a little extra half hour maybe talking to Uenta. So she leans up with the tray and she's trying to say, "Man, you were gone a little longer. I know you need this. You know you've got to really need this bad now." And she was right every single time in life except that one time. Uh, so, <laughs> but as she's starting to say that, she does this. She goes. Hey, man, you, Jeff, mm. is that you? <laughs> like said, she can't recognize you she almost. Can't re- she can't recognize me. I've been gone two hours, same clothes, only person in my house. She literally is having to ask me, what happened? <laughs> what happened to you? I didn't know anything had really happened to me yet. I just knew I would experienced something I liked. <laughs> and for the first time in months, I was able to say, nah, I, I don't think I'm going to do that tonight. I think I'm good. I think I'm going to, you know, get ready and just go to bed. So I go back there and, you know, I get ready and I get in the bed. When I, I, I don't remember everything, but I remember when I lay down, I just said, God, if you're really here and you hear me, and if all this is real, if I feel like doing this, what I feel right now, if I feel the same way in the morning, I'm getting on my knees over there and I'm doing that. Man, when I woke up, it was the first thing. It was just like, oh, yeah. Do I still feel like doing it? 
Heck yeah, I do. <laughs> I rolled out of bed and I just said whatever I said. I don't know what I didn't know because I, you know, so long ago, I don't, I didn't know much, but I'd said something. So a little bit later, I'm, uh, I'm in, I'm driving. I get in a truck and I'm driving and um, get on. I'm on eight twenty. So hold on, I'm gonna set this story up. He's working. He's driving a truck, delivering things, big tools and equipment. And in this truck, something's gonna happen. Go ahead. Yeah, I had to get a job and kind of be a normal <laughs> schedule, you know, going into court and things like that. The and, rules they come up with, you got to get a freaking job. I okay. know. Yeah. So I'm actually on my way to get that truck. Okay. So I'm in my truck, and I'm on 820 East Fort Worth. I turn up, you know, the radio, cranked up KZEW, the zoo, just like I do every morning. I'm driving and felt so good about my morning. And I just, I said, man, I would just really love to hear somebody talk about God. I bet you anything there's a station on this radio where there's a preacher. God, it's crazy. So I'm rolling, and then there's, you know, I hear soul music. No, no, that's not it. I roll more, I hear Spanish. I'm like, no, no. You know, and I roll again, and then tunes in, and there's a guy yelling. Bingo. And I said, I bet you this is a preacher. <clears throat> It sure was a preacher. His thing turned out to be Dwayne Hobbs. Right there at South 820, I'm I'm veering off onto I-20. I'm driving down I-20 there by Little Road. And this guy, he says, well, you guys, ladies and gentlemen, I, I've got to stop, which this is March 17th, around 10, 15 in the morning, 43 year, uh, 41 years ago today. Mm. And he says, "There's, there's God just come over me. And uh, he says, I got to stop this message because there's something I got to do. He says, there's a person. There's a person listening to us right now. They're in a vehicle. He says, well, this person's asked God into their life this morning. He says, it's a, a matter of fact, it's a young man. And a matter of fact, this young man is on Interstate 20. Oh, wow. And, I'm, you know, of course, I'm on I-20. And I'm, I, I just can't believe my ears. And he says, young man, pull over. And I'm doing this. And he's, that's right, that's right, pull over. And then, that's right, stop the car, that's right. And then he's, he's like, uh, all right, so I want to talk to you about what you've done this morning. You've asked God to come into your life, and he's heard you. So I want, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. And I feel like, you know, I would love – Maybe in heaven I'll get to hear the differences of our two prayers, you know, because mm -hmm. what I don't know what I said in the first one. <laughs> the second mm -hmm. one would have been the more standard, asking Jesus to come into my life. Now when I'm done, I told you know, if if I started crying right now, that wouldn't be that far out of the question, you know, something real cool like this. But in those days, that was very unusual to be crying, you know, 20, 21 years old there on the side of the highway, you know, 24 hours ago, I was a drug addict. And, and I just, uh, I'm sitting there bawling and, and I said, am I losing my mind? What's going on? The radio's talking to me. I'm on the side of the road. I'm I didn't see any dope up. Nothing. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, Right then, he stops again. He says, well, you're just, just a young man. You are crying your eyes out right now, aren't you? Wow. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and he says, you want to know why? And I said, yep, I, that's what I was just wondering. <laughs> and he says, that's because you're feeling God's presence, and you've never felt it before. But this is God's presence, and it's going to be with you. And your life has changed. It's never, ever going to be the same. So raise your hands up in there and say, praise the Lord. And I did. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and uh, he said, okay, you're good. Drive on. I wrote him a letter and got to correspond with him a couple of times after that. But I was delivered from drugs right then. The, the deal was over. Jeff, I think it's so crazy. I want to, we all know what FaceTime is, right? You know, on our phone. That's so normal in the day we're in. When you're telling the story, it's like you're on FaceTime. You're actually talking to him. Yes, sir. But you're in the truck by yourself. <laughs> Before face, and Facebook. It's prophetic or, uh, you know, word of knowledge, whatever it was, this obedient brother 
starts putting this out and salvation coming. And, and I was sitting there just thinking, you're a dope addict. You're, you're, you don't know anything. You just know, roll out and just say, Hey man, let's do the deal. And I'm in and Jesus, I think you're kind of cool. And, but the scripture in Romans tells us real clear, you've got to confess with your mouth. You got to believe in your heart. There's, and you've got to do a couple of things. And I think if you've ever gone out to your car and you try to start it and click, 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 and you lift up the hood and somehow that that cable was popped off or not on there right or tightened up, I think God just sent this guy like a mechanic and just said, man, bless his heart, he got these cables on as best he could. <laughs> but I'm going to tighten these suckers down where they're never coming off. And we're going to secure this salvation once and for all, and that's what Scripture says. I think it's First John one nineteen. Who cares where the address is? It says anyone who confesses their sins to God, He's faithful to cleanse us, and He's just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. And that's what you experienced right there, which happens that all word is past, present, and future, all of it. Not not just what He did, not what He was doing, but what He was ever going to do. And it's the craziest story. It's one of my most favorite story. And I'll have Jeff come back on because I've never been with somebody that hangs out, fellowships, who gets divine revelation like my cousin. And that change and transformation is incredible how you go from one person to another person. So I got one question. You still got a court date. and <clears throat> Yeah, I do. Yeah. So I go back to the church. You know, I can't wait. You know, I cannot wait for the next church service. And uh, <laughs> Not weird anymore. No, I can't. And, I, you know, I, I get you, into and I find her, and I tell her. And I don't know how I would receive that, but sh she received it. God had evidently done something on her end because she didn't doubt it. She believed it 100%. And— you know, her and I became best friends, even mm -hmm. with our big age difference. Till the day she died, I, I was, uh, and I'd consider her my best friend for, for all them years. And I that feel really cool. strong she would have too. Mm. But she, so she just couldn't wait to go get Paul Delina and tell Paul. And Paul. He's talking to you now? <laughs> he, he listens to my story and he's kind of, you know, he's kind of weighing it out. And it doesn't take but a few, I don't know, time flies, a few short weeks, and then, you know, Paul and I are friends. He's watching and you it, for a couple of weeks to see. Yeah, and uh, then he actually says, there's an attorney here in our church I want to introduce you to that uh, that I think he'd be better for you. And um, anyway, so they would, so, I mean, he took an interest in it, and uh, he's, he's definitely a hero of all time. Paul Delaney, he's something else. Oh, sweetheart. The court date comes, and um, they offer me uh, on the three felonies deferred adjudication, which was the first time I'd ever heard that word in my life or that phrase. And what they were saying was, if you ever screw up again, uh, it you get to face whatever your new thing is, plus these three, are, they come back up like they're brand new. And... Uh, this attorney said, I don't recommend this for most people. And I said, you mean that's it and I'm done? He goes, yeah. I said, well, I'm never doing drugs again. That's <laughs> Jesus is my I, best I friend, mean, dude. I'm not even speeding. I'm like, I'm, not, I'm ready to just, you know, I'm ready to go on with my new life. So I did. I walked through and, you know, breezed right through the thing. It was 10 years probation and two years of. You got uh, a two-year, I mean, a 10-year hanging the hammer. With a two-year probation. Right. Yeah. Super intensive, uh, intensive supervision or something, which was three drug tests a week. and uh, You which, were passing all those? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those were easy. Man, credible story. Well, Jeff, we we could go on and on. Uh, we're going to start landing this plane. Uh, I, I just want to say you out there, he was the first one, and I always say, you know, he's the worst one, all that, but. This is the guy that led me to Jesus, and almost the same scenario happened to me with less intensity, but I was still facing a felony, and Bethel Temple, and you get me going there, and 
I received Jesus. <laughs> Two idiots, <laughs> complete <laughs> idiots. But I want you to tell them, you know, these these two idiots, two idiots plus Jesus makes two brilliant sons of God. And we become sons of God. Tell them what happened in our family because of your obedience. Well, I guess it's obedience, Mark. I mean, I think I think God has people he can trust with obedience and he and he points them in a direction. And then I think there's people like <laughs> me and you where he just he just said, I'm just gonna make it so easy. For them, had to, yeah, and it just you know, just fill it in for them. It's all you got to do is just sign here. You know, I've completed everything for you. But it was kind of neat, Mark. Uh, I mean, not kind of neat. You know, I I don't know. I don't want to speak for, you know, our whole family, but I just never heard God mentioned in our entire family before, except in vain. And um, <laughs> for sure. And um. You know, we went from that to when I first, you know, when I first started believing and receiving Jesus and reading my Bible and wanting to share verses and share things, you know, I was shooed away. And then next thing, Mark comes, and he's even more bold about it than I am. And then he's sharing it. And if you ever get us two together, you know, we would have added strength and confidence, <laughs> and we would really bully him in you know, like we're bullying. We take gonna, over the atmosphere. You're going to hear about God right now, and uh, man, we would get told some really harsh things, and um, you know, people weren't wanting to receive that at the time. But as time goes on, uh, everyone who's passed away has received the Lord before, well before, yep. some close to yep. the the day. And if you think about the big. Sp- Spread now of how big our or how big our families have got, you know, with marriages and kids and grandkids, and you know the numbers are getting huge. Mm-hmm. You can just easily say, you know, if, if I hear the name Owings, I'm thinking the Christian family. One hundred. We are definitely a Christian family now. I <clears throat> here's one thing I really like to think about, and it doesn't give me pride in me; it gives me thankfulness to God. But the next generation from going back to 83, the next generation was going to be even worse. And then it was going to get worse again. Mm. And when you look now, everyone in our family, all of our kids, you know, they've they've all got wonderful spouses mm. and wonderful direction where they're heading in life and their walk with the Lord. And in in the in the walk of being a good citizen, you know, right? Not being a drain to the world, but being a plus, you know, a positive <laughs> to this world. So when I look at that, and I just think, man, there was a guy that turned me in, and it was an undercover narcotics agent that deceived me and tricked me. And there were years, or not years, but there was a a period of time where, when I thought of him, I had fantasies of running into him somewhere. Laying hands on him? I, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, just something. Even if it was verbal, just right. to rip him apart somehow. Now what would you say? Man, if I ever see that guy, I, I would love to give him the biggest hug. And I've fantasized about that for years, too. Like, and thank you for your obedience, you know, because that turn of events and my mom not being okay with me going to prison – Man, that little shift in the timeline and the history of of our family, it changed everything. And when we look at the blessings of all of our family now, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm Huge. shocked. And it, there's no, you know, I travel in churches. You know what I do? Jeff is a very, very successful businessman, owns car lots. That's where I came to work for when I got saved, and he's done well. And we both gone through our ups and downs in this journey with Christ. It hadn't been perfect. And a lot of times, you know, I can say this for Jeff because I got this quote from him. Hey, if you're following us, you know, we're the worst Christians, but Jesus is the best God. And so if you're out there and you don't know Jesus, you can just roll out of bed and do the best you can. And God will put that mechanic in your life to make sure that those cables are connected in the right way. If you're a mom fighting for your kid, don't give up. 
don't be okay with them going to prison. And if you're the only Christian in your family, keep preaching, keep sharing, keep loving, because everyone in our household came to know Jesus. Are they perfect? No. But they all know who he is, and he's he's been faithful to our family. And we, Jeff, can you believe that we've gone 50 minutes at this, but there's, there's books that should be written. I wanted to dedicate this podcast, this episode, to his oldest brother, Tommy Owens, who went to be with the Lord last year. And I had the privilege, along with a really beautiful man in our, our life, but specifically Jeff's life, uh, Bob Massey, and he was part of my life through this. I got to do that celebration service. We don't call them funerals at the Owings family. We call them celebration service because we got the golden ticket. We're out of here. <laughs> and OTO's up there looking at us going, hey, man, it's better than we could have ever imagined. Can't wait you. And Uncle Tom's there. My dad's there. Aunt Rainey's there. All of it. So, Jeff, final words of prayer. Anything you want to say to someone watching this, look at that camera right there and you got any final words you want to say? Well, I love what you just said, Mark. If anyone's out there and you've got somebody that's struggling and it doesn't have to be to the level I was or the level of lostness that I was, but if there's anyone out there that you want to see change, just stick with it. Stick with trusting God and know that God loves them and can definitely come in and change their life. And the, the ride after that, with the ups and the downs is the best thing that could possibly ever happen in any of our lives. Come on. Well, you heard it on the Unbridled Life. Share this, like this, follow us, share it with a friend, how we get the message out, not so we can grow, so that we can share the message of Jesus to people. Share this and listen to this. Thanks so much for listening to the Unbridled Life podcast. We know your time is valuable, and we hope we bring real and relevant content that helps you live that unbridled life. If you want to help us spread the message, you can rate or review the podcast on whatever platform you like to listen to us and share it with a friend or two. If you want to know more about who we are and what we're doing, head on over to the unbridled life podcast.com and learn more.